Welcome to Eclectic Research Esoteric Results Presentation. It's a pleasure to be here at Intent, uh, a conference by researchers for researchers. And with that spirit, I've, I bring some of my own research to, to share with you, share not only the, the technicalities of, of the bugs, but also and maybe even more uh, what I felt during the, the research, the, the results, my expectations, and things that uh, we don't usually share unless we are talking to our peers, our, our fellow researchers. So, but first things first, who am I? I'm, my name is Pedro Molino. Uh, I'm principal security researcher at Bitside. Uh, this is kind of a, a new position for, for, for me. I'm recently joined Bitside and, and I get people uh, asking me, so what do you mean you, you do research at a security ratings company? Actually, there's, there's, there's a lot of research going on, even more than one research department. So, so yeah, it has been some challenging days. Anyway, uh, this is my, my contacts are there. Uh, feel free to, to reach me I, with questions or comments or whatever you want. I'll, I'll try to answer the, the best of, of my abilities. So, why the strange title talk? Eclectic research and esoteric results. Uh, eclectic research, I, I, I've, I bring a lot of different uh, research and results, uh, things that I've worked on, not only from ap applicational point of view in terms of security, but also IoT security, server-side security, radio uh, emissions and stuff like that. So there's a lot of variety in, in, in the research that I, that I do, luckily, uh, and esoteric results, it's because sometimes what the results that you get uh, or the impact that you get is not exactly aligned with your expectations. And uh, sometimes it's, 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 it's interesting to share that uh, with other researchers. So my motivation for this talk, as I said, is to, to share share this the, the, my, my old research and not so old. Uh, I'm going to talk about processes and, and bugs that I found. I, I'll go a bit into the technical side, but not much, ju just a brief explanation of what happened. And I'm mostly focused about talking uh, about results, about expectations, about what went wrong or what I thought it would be the end result and then I, I got wrong. So it's kind of um, a talk that it's not easy to have when, when you're just explaining a vulnerability with, with someone that's, that doesn't work in security research. The agenda for today, I'll talk about a, a Samsung bug that, that I found. I'll talk about Tinder Drift. I'm going to talk about NFC Drift, uh, uh, Samsung Find Mobile, uh, Find My Mobile uh, flaw, uh, a bug about manipulating the, uh, the Google camera app, uh, hacking a smart vacuum, uh, hacking an IoT uh, doorbell, and Project IO433. So it, there's a lot of different things going on, and I will try to follow the same format for, for the different bugs. Uh, and and talk about uh, how the how the whole process went. So without further ado, because there's a, a lot of different vulnerabilities here, I will start with uh, 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 a, a flaw in the Samsung Android uh, application uh, dubbed SV two eighteen eleven four six nine. So this was independent research. Uh, and the story behind it, the motivation behind it was that I really wanted a new phone. <laughs> so at the time, uh, I wanted a flagship uh, phone uh, from Samsung. I think the, the, the most advanced one is Samsung S8 at the time or S8 Plus, and they were really expensive. So the, the, the contract kind of that I, I made uh, in my home uh, with my wife was that, okay, I'm going to buy this phone. It's like $1,000. But don't worry, uh, I'm going to submit, uh, I'm going to uh, audit the phone, I'm going to find a bug and submit to the bug bounty and I will have enough money to buy this phone and I will buy uh, the same phone for everybody in my, in my family. So it was no pressure. <laughs> the research process was, um, it, it will be recurring throughout this presentation. Uh, when I'm doing uh, Android audits. So you, I ended up listing all the packages that can uh, pre-installed in, in, in the device. Uh, I screen for potential candidates. Uh, I usually, I, I make a list and, and try to figure out uh, which packages would be more impactful if they have uh, a vulnerability. 
Uh, this means uh, the packages that export more components or, and, and or ask for more permissions. So there's kind of a initial screening uh, process. And then I'll just methodically start reversing each, each of the packages and try to find something. So in the end, uh, in this case, I was able to find a flaw in the context application that allowed me to place privileged video calls, uh, run SS codes and USSD codes without permissions. So you can do all kinds of nasty stuff like initiate calls or even use USSD codes to reroute the, 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 the calls and stuff like that. So it was uh, impactful. In terms of causes, uh, the, the, it all resumed to uh, an unprotected exported component and it ended up on this function, which uh, in effect, uh, you could control the, the URL kind of, of uh, an action. Or if, you, if you go into Android uh, research, you know that call privilege is the type of action that nobody should be able to use unless uh, uh, an important um, uh, application because you can call uh, numbers that are pay per use and, and so forth. So uh, this was the main cause. In terms of expectations, uh, yes, my expectations were clear. <laughs> I really uh, was taking a risk. So I, I was going, I was not joking. I was going to submit the, the bug. And uh, in the end, I was expecting some bounty. Yes, in the end result was a, a modest bounty was awarded. So I, I, I kept my word. I bought uh, smartphones for, from Samsung for the, the whole family. Uh, they, Samsung also acknowledged me on their webpage. There was some local media uh, coverage in, in, in my country, which is in Portugal. So I think uh, the results was much much better than the expectations. I had like low expectations for, for this research. I really, uh, uh, it was kind of a personal challenge and uh, kind of a bet that I, that I made. <laughs> and uh, in the end, um, like the, the, the acknowledgement and the, the, the media coverage, of course, it's something that is important uh, when, when you're doing this kind of research. Although since it was independent research, it was not that important as the research when you are being paid for from a company. So moving on, Tinder Drift. This was research made under the check marks umbrella. Uh, the motivation here was to find bugs in most popular applications in the markets, in particular those that deal, dealt with sensitive information. So there was a research process that uh, initially involved trying to figure out which uh, applications were being used by most users and cross, cross check that with the type of data that uh, was being manipulated by those applications. Of course, Tinder and other dating apps appeared uh, in the list and it was one that I audited. So in the end, the combination of this research, uh, I made a tool called Tinder Drift. Uh, there are videos online if you want to, to search. Uh, essentially, what the, the application the, did was uh, analyze the traffic and it could replicate what the user uh, of Tinder was doing on his mo mobile file phone in real time. Um, the causes for this were two minor, so to speak, bugs. So the image prefetcher in the application used standard HTTP. So the, the images were fetched in an unencrypted form. And the API, API calls to the, to the Tinder servers had a predictable size according to the user actions. So if the user was swiping left or swiping right, the size of the, of the, the packets were different. So these two minor things when combined, uh, if you are in a position to look at the traffic like a ISP provider or someone in your local Wi-Fi network, you can actually profile the user and see if they were swiping right or left or having a match. Uh, the only thing that you could not see was uh, what he was typing on screen. So, but anyway, these were kind of two simple flaws and the expectations was, okay, we're going to talk with Tinder. This is going to be a, a, an easy fix, kind of add an S to the HTTP. Uh, so yes, but, but, but no. So what happened was, there was a lot of resistance uh, to consider the, the, the image prefetcher uh, vulnerability. And um, 
the reason uh, was that all images are public. Uh, so anyone could actually fetch those images from the Tinder servers. So I understand the reason from, from the company side, but it, it took a while to explain that if, if you can actually join all of these factors together, besides there being small importance when they when they are all together, the, the importance is much bigger than, than one isolated case. Uh, we did a video demonstrating the vulnerability and the media picked it up and it was kind of a media slaughter and eventually uh, a US senator got involved and actually wrote a letter to the company and after uh, this process then then the, the, the bug was recognized and fixed. In terms of expectations for, for, for myself, uh, I didn't have like the expectations. Uh, honestly, I was trying to find out a flaw and it was hard because the, the, the Tinder app at the time was not, it was pretty well made. So I just find these minor uh, breadcrumbs and I was trying to put together an attack scenario that was meaningful. And so I didn't have a lot of expectations and I, I certainly did not predict this, this stone wall while trying to, to fix the, the, the bug. Luckily, this was something that the, the media picked up and I say luckily because this, of course, this this gave media exposure. That's something as a researcher that sometimes you have to be aware of. But also uh, there was some pressure to fix, and the the fix was was issued. NFC drip. This was also uh, under the umbrella of check marks. Uh, I was not initially doing anything NFC related. I was actually uh, auditing the Android operating system for for another uh, brand. And uh, uh, I noticed there was some functions uh, related to NFC that you can actually bypass the Android permission model. So you can call those functions without uh, specifically ask for permissions. And since I was always interested in uh, out of band data exfiltration methods, I thought that maybe I can do something with it. And I was given uh, green light, although it was a bit esoteric <laughs> research also, that I was given green light to, to try and, and figure out what I could do with it. And so the research process changed from, from you know, auditing an uh, operating system to you know, grabbing my SDR uh, setup and trying to me measure signals to see if I can you know, um, understand what's going on in terms of NFC radio signals. And in the end, uh, the end result was that uh, I, I figured out that I could use the NFC radio of a device and then even of USB dongles uh, more than the four centimeters or 20 centimeters max that they were designed for. I could actually use this as a system to exfiltrate data long range. And I'm talking long range from 10 meters to 100 meters, something that uh, nobody thinks about when they're thinking about NFC. Now, the causes for this is it's that uh, an NFC radio uh, usually needs to emit some high pulse uh, impulse um, for for a passive tag to power up and respond, like uh, your your bank card, your ATM card. It usually nowadays everybody has a, an NFC enabled card and. They don't have batteries, so they actually use the energy that comes from the from the the reader uh, to power up, do the calculations that they had to do, and and still use the rest the, the rest of the remaining signal to respond. And in this way, what I did was by abusing the way that I can configure the reader, like turning it kind of on and off, like uh, let's imagine Morse code but with NFC radio signals, you can turn it on and off and in older versions of Android, you can use that without permissions. Well, the, the fun part of this is that you can actually pick up the signals with a simple AM radio. And then I devised a, an application that you connect. Uh, there's an emitter uh, in, a, in an Android phone, for example, that's uh, emitting or exfiltrating data in background. And there's another application that you can connect to a radio with a phone jack and actually decode the information. So it's a low cost setup to, to have a long range data exfiltration. I was super happy about this research in the end. Uh, of course, this has to be, this has to do with my personal um, 
uh, enjoyment of you know transmitting stuff this kind of seems like hollywood style uh abusing a technology that does not supposed to work like that and uh, and being able to 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 use that technology to exfiltrate the password or whatever so i, I was happy in terms of results this kind of it's kind of impossible to fix it's the way that technology is supposed to work you cannot really go uh, and try to figure out nfc nfc chipsets vendors to to solve it uh, there are some mitigations that you can uh, implement to to defeat this kind of data exfiltration or to make it more hard uh, i gave some talks about it some unidentified persons express their concerns because if you think about air gap facilities where they use this kind of readers to 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 open and close doors for example uh, there are some challenges uh, that were communicated to me in, in this regard. There were some modest me media covers. So I was really happy. I was said that like all exfiltration uh, things, uh, they usually, you know, that there's a, a piece, uh, there's a story and then the thing dies off. Uh, I would like to continue this research someday, but right now it's, it's, uh, it's in the, the back shelf over there. <laughs> Next, uh, find my mobile application. This uh, was a Char49 research, sponsored research. Uh, the idea here was that uh, I had some notes when I started to, to hack into the Samsung S8 device. I had some notes and um, uh, a lot of things I wasn't able to explore. I had no time to explore. So I just, uh, I kept them and they were like on, on, under the hood, so, so to speak. And Char49 reached out and, and helped me grab this research and, and revive it again. So the research process uh, is kind of the same as auditing uh, Android operating systems, but uh, I had some findings. So I, I, I was interested in leverage the, the previous findings that I had. One of those findings was related to the Find My Mobile application. Uh, in the end, the impact of this research uh, enables an attacker to complete control the Find My Mobile application, which allows to locate the, the mobile phone, uh, grab SMSs, you can do remote locks, you can do remote wipes and completely factory reset the phone. So it's just kind of a nightmare scenario. And there was another related flaw, but server side that would allow the, uh, an un unauthenticated attacker to completely disable the Find My Mobile uh, infrastructure worldwide. So it was pretty cool. But related to, to, to this flaw in particular in the Find My Mobile application, the causes were a, a complex chain of four different vulnerabilities. It all started with you being able to write a particular file to the SD card, which is a, a pretty standard permission to ask, ask uh, access to the external storage. And if you were able to write this file, then you are able to uh, change the, the API endpoints that the, the Find My Mobile application was using. And then you can position yourself like a med in the middle between the Find My Mobile application and the, the, the backend servers. Then there were some flaws in the way that the communication were, were, was made with the backend servers that you can actually uh, change the messages on the fly and you can tell the Find My Mobile application like, okay, there's this uh, action that you need to do that was requested by the user and, and you need to execute. So you can like remotely control the, the Find My Mobile application. So I was, I was very satisfied to, to reach, this was a kind of a complicated research. Each of these four vulnerabilities were very uh, unsuspected in a way that alone, they don't have a lot of impact. Um, and I, I, yeah, I was thinking about a, a nice bounty and so forth. And in the end, Samsung was quite fast to respond. They, they, they have an awesome security team. You just, um, there's the people, persons on the other side, they know what you're talking about. It's, they are easy to deal and you can communicate easily. The, the, they, they issue a fix pretty, pretty fast for some of the stuff. Uh, others were, others vulnerabilities were more complicated, but in the end for this particular vulnerability, a 10K bounty was, was issued, which was okay. There was no public acknowledgement at this time. 
uh, but there was some medium high uh, uh, media coverage like for Security Week, Hacker News and so forth. So it was a bit aligned with my expectations. Uh, I think a, a bit aligned also with my company's expectations at the time, Shore 49. So it, overall it was good. Although I, I must admit, I was thinking about the a bigger bounty, but it's not always about the bounty. <laughs> now continue. Uh, Google camera. Now this was a check marks research. Uh, it, it follows the same line as auditing uh, mobile devices or smart, smartphones. And this, in this case, it was Google Pixel uh, 2 and 3. So the idea here was to increase the security awareness and best practices among, amongst mobile phone providers. So grab a, a bunch of different uh, devices and figure out the pre-installed packages and what, what default uh, vulnerabilities, so to speak, come with the different brands of phones. In this case, it was a Google Pixel uh, tree. Uh, the research process is it's the same as I talked about uh, while when dealing with phones. And in the end, the result was uh, that an attacker could manipulate the Google camera app to spy on the user. It could make the Google camera app uh, start to take photos or videos or even record the phone calls because if, if if you record a video while you're talking on the phone, usually you can also hear the voice on, on the other side. Uh, you can grab the GPS tags from the photos and so forth. And one interesting thing is that you, you could do all of this, even if the phone, the screen was off, even if the phone was locked without the, uh, the user needed to unlock or put the pin or whatever. So this is quite interesting. Now, the causes, uh, themselves were were um, not very complicated like there was a specific action that could be called in the google camera to start to record there was a, another specific action that you can call on the google camera app to take a timed photo and there was a specific flag that you can use to make it work while the screen was off or even during a call so uh, in terms of complexity, it was not a very complex uh, bug. Uh, it was probably harder to find because you have to read a lot of code, but it was not very complicated from, from my point of view. Um, we did a very nice uh, POC, so, so there was, uh, so there, there's a, you, what you see there on the bottom screen, it's a, an application that actually uh, receives incoming uh, calls from from compromised phones and, and could record and could uh, geolocate where the user was at and so forth because of the of the photos that it took. So we present this this POC to to Google and Google was quite fast responding after they classified as a high vulnerability. Uh, they actually contacted a lot of other vendors uh, that shared the same code base. They issued a fix. It was all coordinated. It, uh, the process worked really well. And in the end, they, they out of the blue, so to speak, they issued a 75K bounty, which was uh, overwhelmingly uh, more than, than uh, we could expect. So there was a high media coverage also. So all in all, uh, if I think about my expectations here, with, which were a bit low and uh, I was not really satisfied with, you know, trying to stretch uh, a not so intellectual challenging bug uh, into a, a nice POC. Uh, but the, in the end, the results were, were, were very good. Uh, and uh, I was not expecting nothing like that. Moving forward, another check marks research. IoT devices. So we were looking into several IoT devices, uh, in particular those would have uh, cameras and sensors. So in this case, it was a Trifo Iron Pie. It, it's a, it was a vacuum cleaner that actually had a, a camera, and you can connect to it and see if there's like burglars in your house. It was sold like a security. You can vacuum your floor and have a security solution all in one. Uh, the idea here was to increase security awareness and best practices amongst IoT providers. And we as researchers, when, when we think about any IoT device <laughs> which has a camera, we start to you know, uh, wonder what could possibly go wrong if you connect a random camera to the internet. So the research process here for IoT, my research process is a bit different. Uh, 
you can dive into very different aspects of security. So usually an IoT device can, comes with a, a companion app or a, a website that you can access. So you, you get to look into the, the mobile application. Uh, you get to look at the backend servers so you can see the communications between the, the mobile application and servers, the hardware and the servers. And, and if you want, you could go deep and look at the hardware itself. Uh, so it's kind of a full stack security audit. It, and it, it's something that for me as a researcher, it brings me great joy because I like to, to, to mess around with all different aspects of, of security. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of those kinds of projects that are very fun to, to, to participate in. So in the end, in terms of results, uh, I was able to man in the middle the application update process and also connect to the video feeds of any vacuum device in the world. Let's say there's, uh, you know, the manufacturers are, are, are testing the, 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 the robot at the factory and you, you could connect there and see the, the, the guys building the robot. I'm not saying we did that, we didn't, but in theory that would be possible, for example. So, and in terms of hardware itself, uh, it was possible to, to route the vacuum uh, via a USB cable. So there are many different uh, vulnerabilities here. And so there are many causes uh, for the application itself. Uh, there was a custom upgrade procedure in, in, the, in the Android application. They weren't using the, the Android the store or the standard process of updates. They were just contacting a, a server in China and downloading an APK uh, via HTTP. So it was easy to intercept the request and substitute uh, the, the APK for your own. There were misconfigurations in the MQTT servers that allowed you to subscribe to, to the channels and see all vacuums. And although the encryption between the vacuums and, and the MQTT servers was encrypted, uh, when I was able to get the firmware from, from the vacuum, I was able to, do, to reverse the encryption process. And from then, you can access every device in the, in the world. You can control it. You can access the video feed. So uh, it's kind of a worst case scenario here. In terms of expectations, uh, this is kind of not Google or not uh, Samsung. So you don't expect it to be uh, uh, very visible. Uh, uh, you don't expect that there will be any bounty involved or whatever. But in terms of research for me, it was highly satisfactory because I really enjoy uh, doing all those different uh, areas of security and see how everything connects. So it, this hacking into an IoT device usually gives you the opportunity to, to, to get your hands on all of those uh, different kinds of security. So in terms of results, uh, the vendor was contacted multiple times and, 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 and up to this day, there was no response. So uh, there is nothing we can do there. Uh, eventually, the, after one year or so, we published uh, an article uh, with some details, not all because we don't have any interest in, in damaging the, the brand, but we, we just wanted to, to alert persons and, and, and show our, our work. Next in line, a smart doorbell uh, under the umbrella of cyber delay research. Um, it's kind of the same because it's an IoT device and has a camera. Uh, in this case, it's a doorbell. And we were looking into all devices that claim to have smart or machine learning or artificial intelligence features. And this camera was, was one of them. Um, the research process is kind of the same. Uh, it's the full stack security audit, so to speak. And in the end, uh, I was able to install rogue firmware into, into the device via man in the middle attack. Uh, it was possible to access the snapshots, the regular snapshots that the camera uh, takes an, uh, of any user in the world. And this camera in particular stores videos in the camera itself when someone rings the, rings the bell and it uses military grade encryption. <laughs> so uh, when we hear the word military grade encryption, we, yeah. So what happened was that it's actually the, the, the encryption was well done, but had some flaws that we'll get into it and you can get root access into the camera by connecting a special wire. So again, many vulnerabilities, different causes. 
Uh, the firmware flash was because of the fail certificate validation, which is something that you see throughout the IoT landscape. Uh, it's quite worrisome. <laughs> um, the ability to access any snapshot from any camera was because it was, it was a server side issue. It was a kind of a, a pet traversal that you can do on the serial number of, of the of the device. Uh, it kind of reminds you of the, the recent Apache vulnerability. Um, the the video log decryption was interesting because when when the camera generates a video or records a video of whoever rings the bell, it actually generates a key and encrypts the video and sends the key back to the server and deletes the key. Uh, so in principle, everything is okay because the, the keys, if someone steals the device, they cannot decrypt the, the videos because there's no key on the device itself. Unfortunately, the way the key is generated is based on the current timestamp, which is actually part of the file name. So you only need the file and the file name to derive the, to derive the key and decrypt the, the video logs. So that was unfortunate. Also, in the if you look at those uh, under underlined red, there were six uh, exposed pins on the back. Access the back of the camera was really simple. You just uh, need a paper clip and you can just uh, take it out. And if you access those pins, you can actually, we, I actually produce a special cable that uh, just maps out those pins to a USB OTG breakout. And you can flash the firmware on, on the cable on, on the on the camera uh, with a with a special procedure. So again, uh, this is not very well known brand. Uh, the expectations in, on those regards were not high. But again, I, I I had a blast as a researcher. This this uh, these are the projects that really uh, allow you to to go deep into all areas of security. Uh, again, the vendor was contacted multiple times. There were no replies. There were some media fuzz about it, and and then the, the issue died there. Moving forward, last but not least, Project IO433. So, the motivation for this project is a bit different. This is an independent research, also, and I actually I, I lost my garage door remote. Okay, <laughs> and if you and if you look back. Uh, at, at the things that I got here, I got a lot of electronics and a lot of stuff. And I was like, okay, I, I'm not going to buy a new remote. I'm going to make one. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can make one. I have some 433 megahertz modules and I'm, I'm just uh, figure out how this works and I'm going to make my own remote. Uh, so the research process, process here was, uh, I grabbed my SDR material. I, I, I still had one working remote. So I, I was trying to measure the signal and, and see if I can make just a, a, a copier. So I, I will just replay the signal and open the gate. And there were some issues there because sometimes that worked, sometimes that didn't work. I was not figuring out, I was moving too fast in my research because I just wanted a, 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 quick, uh, a quick solution. And I had to go back and investigate a bit about my particular remote and it used rolling codes. So it was not easy to, to, to hack into, and I have to go back to the start and try to figure out if I could break the rolling codes. So in the end, the implications was that I, I was able to make a remote, and I'll explain why. Because the rolling code in, in this particular brand is not really rolling. Uh, it's just don't repeat the last signal. So if, if you just send out a random signal to, to, the, to the right address, uh, the door would open it. Uh, as long as it was the same as the last one. So uh, the expectations here was just to, to, to produce a remote for myself. But then I started to think, okay, uh, I really would, uh, it would be handy if I had a device that can listen just for uh, 433 traffic and I can join some of, module, some of the modules, hardware modules that I have uh, to do that, and that's how IO433 was born. It's an open source software and hardware project. It just needs like two components and connect some wires, and you have a system that you can monitor, sniff, copy, replay, and analyze most of, of uh, amplitude shifting signals so far, but there's no reason for it 
uh, not to be programmed to support like frequency shifting and others. It's something that I really enjoy doing. Uh, I hope sharing this with the community brings uh, brings a bit more development. I have some friends of mine that are using it. And this is something as a researcher that gives me great joy when, when you just trying to solve a problem of, a, of your own and you see value in sharing it. And if another person joins in and also sees value in that and, and, and a small project starts to grow, it's something that's fulfilling, at least for me. This was the, end, the, the last one uh, that I bring to share with you today. I have uh, some minor conclusions or some conclusions of my own. Some of them are also shared. And I think as a security researcher, uh, I find motivations in, in many day-to-day uh, -day situations. Uh, it doesn't have to be that I have to uh, research a particular brand or, or, or project. Uh, most of the times I, I, uh, I'm lucky enough, so I have green light to try and choose the projects that I want to dedicate my time. And, and this also implies that the research process kind of flows with the project. So I try to adapt what works and discard what doesn't work and try to improve, keeping in mind that uh, when I have uh, projects of a particular class, I already kind of know what I'm doing. If it's IoT, I'm doing like this. If, if, if it's uh, Android projects, which I am also used to do, I have kind of a process, but it's, it's, it flows. Uh, one lesson that I learned and I have learned throughout the times is that um, the real impact of the research may not be the impact that you think it is. <laughs> Sometimes you're too focused or too geeky and you think too involved and you think the impact is going to be one thing but then there's no impact at all, or sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's about managing expectations also, which is an unpredictable uh, exercise. And yes, results may vary. It's the life of a, of a researcher, I guess. Uh, and hence the, the title for the talk. It's, you can do a lot of different research in the different areas and uh, you still get esoteric results. You still get results that, that change uh, and are not aligned with your expectations. And as a conclusion for myself that I, I just want to share this is that what gives me more intellectual pleasure does not always equal to money or positive impact or media impact or peer recognition. Sometimes it does. And for me, finding a balance between those things that sometimes are a necessity. We all need money to live. Uh, if you're working for a company, of course, you have to be mindful if there's going to be media impact or not. We all like peer recognition for, for our work and we, we want to do good research and, and meaningful research. And if I can balance those things and, and continue to you know, explore different uh, parts of security or areas of security, then, then I'll be a happy, a happy hacker. And, and uh, a happy hacker is, is a productive one. And I know we are all different. And one of the, of the questions that I have for, for my friends and one of the questions that I want to end this presentation for you is, uh, uh, I think in the end, I, uh, I'm very curious to know what, what drives you as a researcher. Now there's some time for questions and answer. And... Thank you for listening to me.